I usually start the discussion of the ancient Egyptian temple science with this particular slide. Now, this slide here, from the masterwork by Schwaller de Lubitz, that's called The Temple of Man. This one in the book is titled Thoth, Master of the Net at Karnak. So the first thing to be aware of is that this particular being was considered to be the initiator of the spiritual culture of Egypt. And when the Egyptians would use the head of an animal, it represented a state of consciousness and a type of primordial power. So it wasn't that they worshipped animals, it was that they understood that various aspects of power from the mind of God manifest itself in different beings and different processes, and that the state of consciousness and power manifests in particular animals. And those animals then have the head on the body of a human being. Now, this being was not referred to as Thoth by the Egyptians. That's a later Greek corruption of the name. The original name is closer to Jehaute or Tehute. And this being is shown stretching the cord. And the stretching of the cord ritual in ancient Egypt has to do with the mystery that is central to every great spiritual tradition. How is it that we are conscious spiritual beings living in a physical world, in a physical body, and don't remember who we are or how we got here? It has to do with the whole process of creation connected to what we think of today as sacred geometry. The process of moving from what in physics today we call a singularity and was always the concept of the center in ancient traditions such as the Bindu point in the Himalayan tradition. And from that zero-dimensional beginning singularity unified core point, you then move out into the first dimension of space. So he is stretching the cord to start to create space, to start to create a container in which conscious beings can evolve and attain higher states of development. So after making the first dimensional movement and the second dimensional movement and the third dimensional movement, you've created a three-dimensional space. Now what's behind this on the temple walls, this is also in the book by de Lubitz, and here he calls it Thoth Master of Numbers at Karnak. It shows something that Egyptologists know about, but they don't understand the significance of, which is that there is a background net that the master designers in ancient Egypt used to lay out the figures on the temple wall. But it wasn't simply something so that you could arrange the aspects of the art on the wall. It actually had a vibrational component to it. And so what's actually being represented here in the grid is that one of the primary grids was a 19 level grid. And there's a particular power to the number 19. Every classical tradition understands not only sacred geometry, but sacred numerology. That just as shape has power, so do numbers have power. Now, the tradition that understood the power of the number 19 the best was ancient Egypt. And that was part of their 19-level vibrational grid. Then that knowledge passed into the next spiritual culture that came into that area, which was then Islam. And today, 19 is a sacred number in Islam. So the background grid of energy is also represented in a malleable form that can be directly manipulated and applied in the hands of the initiates. And so when you see on the temple walls in Egypt, the picture of the initiates with the net in their hands, the net is really the fabric of space-time. It is the vibrational grid behind every living being and every structure in the phenomenal world. And so the hieroglyphs that accompany this would often say something like, they are being taught how to catch and cast magic. But that's a translation of an old Egyptian term. And we should bear in mind the saying by the great science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke that magic is a term that we give for a form of technology that we cannot understand. And so that's exactly what's happening here. They're being taught how to use vibrational matrices, vibrational grids that stands behind everything in the physical world, including the human physical body, is based on a specific vibrational grid. Now, just as Jehaute was shown in the previous illustration from the temples, here we have an interaction between one of these great beings and the pharaoh. And today, when we translate the Egyptian text into English, we translate them so that it says that this is a god or a goddess. But that was not a concept from ancient Egypt. They didn't use the term god or goddess. 
they use the term netter, and netter is based on the hieroglyphic language that represents phonetics as the letters NTR. Netter means a conscious force of nature. And so there's no dichotomy for them between a conscious being and a force of nature. Whereas today we have a tremendous dichotomy and we think of nature as being a clockwork mechanism that can be manipulated in some external way. But every classical tradition, particularly the ancient Egyptian, understood that the forces of nature are conscious. They can be communicated with. And part of the initiation process is learning how to communicate with the forces of nature. The term netter is the foundation for the modern English term nature. And so they are the conscious forces of nature and the human initiate reaches out to connect to them, as you see with the hand grasping the arm. And then the netter interacts with the person through particular forms held in the hand. So we have here the waz scepter and the ankh. Now these things are interpreted today by Egyptologists as being abstract symbols, so that the ankh represents life, for example. But there's much more to it. These things are actually geometric energy emitters, that the shapes that they represented actually were the forms that emitted specific vibrational powers. And you'll note that the forms are being introduced around the area of the person's sinus cavities. And I went to a, a conference a year ago here in Silicon Valley that was the TransTech conference in which people were developing new technologies to be able to manipulate human brain states. And many of these devices are based on inserting diodes into the nose and being able to activate aspects of the brain through flashing particular flicker rates with these LEDs that then directly affect brain states. Because they found that by inserting them up the nasal cavity, you can directly affect the brain. And so you can see they're doing the same thing here. There's a direct connection to the pineal pituitary and all of the forces in the third ventricle of the brain, what was called the cave of Brahma in the Himalayan tradition, through the introduction through the sinus cavity. So the concept here is that the initiate is learning how to communicate with the netters and that geometric forms emanate specific types of energy that are a part of the initiation and allow them to manipulate the net. So next to it is a pendulum from ancient Egypt that they called the Waj pendulum. And the Waj pendulum, the later French researchers referred to as simply the Egyptian pendulum. The hemispherical cap creates a penetrating carrier wave of energy that comes out of the tip. And the double zigzag lines which have a energetic effect, but are also the letter N in the hieroglyphic language, actually change the vibrational state of the ray coming from the hemispherical cap. So when it exits the tip, it has been cleaned of some of its detrimental components. And so when we see all these pictures, once again, of the geometric energy emitters that are being used for interaction between the netters, the higher conscious forces of nature, and human beings who are at the higher initiate level, there are particular subtle radiations coming from geometric shapes and forms. That is the true science of sacred geometry. Much of what we describe in modern metaphysics with sacred geometry is an intellectual aspect of it, but not the actual energy science of it. In ancient Egypt, they used the energy science of sacred geometry and the power of the shape caused wave. So the Ankh is not just an intellectual symbol that represents life, it actually emanates a penetrating carrier wave from its base and the opposite vibrational wave from its top. That's why in pictures from ancient Egypt you'll sometimes see the top being going toward the nasal cavity into the brain of the person and sometimes they'll be turned around the other way for the base. Some of the secrets of ancient Egypt through this vibrational science is that different geometric forms based on the shape caused wave create different energetic effects. But well, there's a deeper level behind that, and that is different geometric forms actually resonate with different levels of creation or planes of nature. So this is a form that we use in advanced level of biogeometry called the Ibrahim Karim Universal Pendulum. And it actually combines shapes of multiple different plane levels, the physical, the vital, the emotional, astral, the mental, the causal, the spiritual, and the divine levels. 
not all have particular geometries that resonate with them. This means that by using the correct geometric form, the ancient Egyptians understood they could create a direct resonant exchange, like with an antenna, based on the sacred geometry. Sacred geometry became an antenna to resonate with a particular higher plane. So for example, if we take a look at this level, what in the human being is the emotional body and emotional function, and referred to as an outer plane in the Western tradition as the astral plane. Astral coming from a root aster, meaning star, meaning a source of light. And the forms that connect to that are the form of a hemisphere or a pyramid. So when they use the form of a pyramid, the shape itself acts like an antenna for the astral plane. And that's why they knew further that by modifying the shape on the pyramid, by making a slight indentation in the center of the four faces of the pyramid, it's so slight you can't see it from the ground. You have to see it from the air. And from the air, you can see here the slight indentation at the faces of the major pyramids at Giza Plateau. What that did is it changed the resonance of the pyramid from the general astral plane, where the lower astral has some questionable energetics, to resonate with the higher astral. And when you do that, it cleans up the energy that's being projected by the pyramid. So one of the great secrets is the geometries act like antennas to resonate with higher planes of creation. And then as a secondary effect, they will emanate through the shape-caused wave a particular vibration that is the result of that particular connection. And they knew enough about it, in fact, to work with sub-bands or sub-energies inside the general band. So the placement of the king's chamber inside the Great Pyramid is not in the exact middle where you might expect it to be. It's not in the middle, it's about 6 degrees 15 minutes off of center. And so that's to get a particular carrier wave that's a sweet spot, a sweet spot for being able to connect a person through a carrier wave to higher dimensional levels, which is why that place in the king's chamber was used for these initiation rituals, as described by the Freemasons and others.